Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 50, the big 50th episode of Third Wheel. I'm one of your hosts, Aaron Conway. And I'm your other host, Hamish. And today we're joined by Luke James. So Luke, someone we haven't actually met before. This is like a first time meeting only five minutes ago. But yeah, Luke, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm going into my final year studying politics at the University of Warwick. I'm also the sport editor of our student newspaper, The Boar, and I run a couple of podcasts as well. So I'm kind of here, there and everywhere at the moment. But yeah, lots of different things to definitely talk about today. And congrats on making it to 50 episodes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do. I don't know if anyone was a betting person. I don't know if they would have betted that this moment would have came. I don't even know if I would have expected us to get to 50. I just think that the moment that we put the money down for it, I think that we weren't going to stop. And that was oh, it. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Once we had to like buy equipment and all that, I guess we were like, okay, we got to do it now. But yeah, so I first heard like about you, Luke. So the ball was always something at Warwick. Actually involved in the ball from first year. As one of the societies I joined, I think I joined the marketing team. I initially did want to write about sports, actually. But I think at the time, they didn't want to... I just kind of wanted to write about Man United, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> and I think at the time, they didn't really want to do any of that kind of stuff, or at least like like Premier League football. They just wanted to focus on like university sports and that kind of stuff. So then I joined like the marketing team, made it like a few like graphics and like promotional videos for them and all that. And then me and Hamish, funny enough, helped out on the website for like a few years. So like the three names at the bottom of the website are actually Tom, Hamish and Aaron. And Tom's like our guest from episode nine or something similar. Flex on them, Aaron, go and tell them our names are written in some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little, little <laughs> low-key flex. But yeah, I actually spotted, so I've like followed all the ball, like sport pages. Also, our first guest, Yash, was a writer for Ball Sport as well during our time there. And... I saw you uploaded a podcast with Robbie, Robbie Lyle, Don Robbie himself, uh, who I know me and Hamish are like big fans of AFTV <laughs> and all that. So I thought, I thought I'd just like ask how like, how did that like happen? And the Ball Sport as well, I didn't even know they had a podcast. Is that something new? Yeah, so that's uh, the Ball Sport. I started the Ball Sport podcast just because I felt like, I mean, everyone's doing the podcast. So I felt like it was kind of the natural progression and kind of yeah. being away from campus and we've kind of. The pandemic and all that kind of stuff it just kind of made sense to do something a bit different we've not had much uptake from like writers because most of them just as you say just want to send me an article about man united and kind of be done with it uh which is interesting but the robbie thing was interesting slightly in this it's like who you know what not what you know so my the film editor came to me it was like i was speaking to one of my writers and she like lives next to robbie in this like apartment block i was like okay and it was like i really want to approach him for an interview and obviously it didn't fit with film so i was like sure we, we can do it for sport and I was yeah. so, at the time, I'll, I'll be honest, I was so uninterested because... Really? Well, one, I didn't think I'd agree to it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I was, like, very sceptical. The other thing, I'd never I'd never really watched it. Like, I'm obviously aware of it, and, like, you see all the viral clips and this kind of thing. Yeah. And I just thought, uh, is it kind of the content that I want to make? But I, I said, look, we'll, we'll go for it and we'll see what we can do. And he agreed, which I was struck down by. And we was talking to him, and, like, at first we we're going to have, like, two hours with the guy. And at that yeah. point, I was just like, this is absolutely bizarre. I honestly didn't believe it was going to happen. And we was kind of going through, like, intermediaries and this kind of stuff. Got to the day of the podcast. And we hadn't actually heard from the man himself. So it was like, oh, we, is this, like, a massive, like, troll fest? Is this going to happen? Got to, like, half an hour before the podcast. I still wasn't entirely sure. Like, we've done a lot of prep for it anyway. And eventually yeah. it kind of happens. And the funny thing as well, obviously we didn't release the video footage. We just released it as a podcast kind of on Spotify and whatever. And we recorded it on Anchor and Skype. And we ha had him on Skype. I couldn't see him throughout the whole podcast. He was just like a blank square. But the other host could see him. So like the whole podcast, I'm like looking out the window because I, I can't see the guy anyway. And I get the recording. So you download it on Skype. And he can see me the whole time. But I just couldn't see him. So it looks like oh. I was being there. <laughs> But no, it went really well. It was really interesting. What struck me as well about the Robbie interview was we kind of recorded it in the aftermath of the racism storm they had. So to give context, during the North London derby, which was kind of the end of the season, Claude, one of the regulars, made a racist remark about Son. And AFTV's response to that was awful. He issued kind of a video where he claimed it was a joke about Tottenham making DVDs. So I pushed him on that and I was amazed that he answered. And what struck me as well, for a guy who I think has quite a bad reputation in terms of the people he associates with. Like a lot of people kind of look at him as a bit of a joke. Yeah. He was so articulate and there wasn't any bravado with him as well. Like he didn't ask for advanced copy of the questions. He had no idea what we wanted to talk about, which again was somewhat bizarre. No, I, th I think huge props to him as well for accepting like the offer, I guess. To him, it probably just seemed like a university podcast, I guess. 
Yeah, for sure. So you didn't speak to him to the actual date. So what was it like a middle, like his management team or something like that? A bit. So it was mainly the neighbor. And then it was like okay. someone from AFTV. And then eventually it was Robbie. But like the first contact that we had with Robbie. So I sent him the Skype link and he just appeared in the chat. And I was like, oh, okay, this is real then. <laughs> but no, that was properly bizarre. But no, we, we got some good kind of sound bites out of him as well because obviously they wanted to send Claude on the course. He was one word away from admitting that he didn't want to go on the course, but that's what he said anyway. Um, <laughs> Which is why he didn't share the ask, uh, share the um, interview afterwards. I think anyway, because it would have caused um, YouTube drama. But it's out there. Yeah, I looked. I looked to see if he shared it because I think that would have. Yeah, that would have helped uh, help any podcast out really if you get the big guest on and then they share it. We spoke about that before, and it was like we could do an easy kind of AFTV is great. Why did you start the channel? Kind of are you a real Arsenal fan? We could have done all the kind of like the easy questions we could have asked him about kind of his argument with Simon Jordan, this kind of thing. And he probably mm-hmm. would have shared it because the AFTV have shared content in the past. Like you go on their social media and like lots of it's retweeted and stuff. Yeah. And it was just like, well, if I want to take this seriously, if I want to do this as a career, I can't really have the guy on after he's overseen like a massive scandal and not ask him about it. So it's like, we're either not doing the interview or we're doing it properly. But no, it was, it was so, so interesting. And, and like props to him as well, because it was massively surpassed my expectations in terms of how willing and open he was to talk about it. And I think a lot of the time he hadn't really considered these things either. Mm. It's like one of the questions I asked, I was like, so because before AFTV, he did reggae and he presented on the BBC and this kind of stuff. And I said, so like, have you always just been passionate about making stuff? It was like, probably, but I never thought of that. And of course, like he's kind of stumbled into this anyway. But no, that was, that was such a bizarre kind of experience. Yeah. What, what do you make of the whole like fan channel? I th- I think fan channels are great to be honest. Just gives like fans, I guess, the chance to voice their opinion. They might not get on like mainstream media or anything. I was wondering, Aaron or Luke, would, would either of you actually go on as a guest or like you know an interviewee to one of these um, fan channels? So, for example, you West Ham and the Red Devils, which I want it's called. Bro, I'd go on and I'd put on the the most silliest like facade, and I just just do it for the views. So then, when the views come back for third wheel, yeah, I'll be there sitting there with, like. <laughs> but that, that's that's kind of the issue with it as well and we we spoke to him about that kind of off camera and we said oh it might have been in the podcast i'm not actually sure we basically said like do people put it on and like what mm. do you do when it's like so ridiculous and he says well we're often accused of over exaggerating this that and the other and he says but the ones who are genuinely just putting it on and just trying to get on camera they just don't publish so obviously we don't see it so the stuff i genuinely i believed him when he said this as well it's like the stuff we publish is genuine and i think a lot of the time people will kind of criticize the regulars for going totally overboard and for flying planes and whatever yeah. it's just like a lot of people who do that probably haven't followed their team to that extent and of course i don't really care about kind of the debate are you a real fan if you don't go to matches i think it's irrelevant if you go to a football match you're going to see those kind of people and like you go to west ham and like you saw the protest i think what two years ago when the guy ran onto the pitch against Burnley yeah. and stabbed the corner flag into the centre circle. Like, people really passionately care about their club. So I believe that a lot of Arsenal fan TV, or AFTV, for <laughs> legal reasons, is legitimate, but it's got that edge to it, hasn't it? And, like, whether or not it's a good thing or not, again, it depends. And I think the re... Can I ask, So why do you watch AFTV? Do you watch AFTV when they win? Very rarely, yeah. It's like, if I know they lost, like, I know there's going to be a nice troops video coming out, and maybe, like, there could be a Thai thing exploding. So this is one of my questions I have as well, like, is Thai acting, like, the entire time? Because if he is, he's one of the best actors, and he's one of the best, like, you know, entertainers out there. If not, then <laughs> I don't know what to think of Thai. I just have to tell myself I believe that he's acting, you know? like he's... I think it's genuine. I think it's all genuine. Yeah, like as Luke said, like these guys, I know the amount of money they've put into the club and the amount of money they spend to go to these games home and away, I I do see it as like it's their life pretty much for some of these people. And even now it's like their career. This is Robbie's full-time job, I assume. And probably even a lot of the people that have become famous from AFTV, it's their career now as well. Wait, Aaron, do you watch it when they win or or lose or both? Probably lose, right? I I probably only watch it when they lose like an embarrassing game. That's the yeah. thing as well. And if, if you look at their channel and you look at the most viewed videos, it's all when they've lost. It's all when kind of someone's having a huge blow up about Wenger. It's yeah. kind of not qualifying for the Champions League. It's getting knocked out of Europe, this kind of thing. It's very rarely positive things. So it's like, and that's the thing as well. That's, that's why people are uncomfortable about it is because people like to look at football fans. 
And again, there's an element of kind of people watch AFTV because they like to laugh at the characters, especially rivals as well. People like to look at Arsenal and go, <laughs> yeah, they're a bit rubbish, aren't they? And like being Man U fans, obviously kind of there's an element of that. You obviously don't want to see Arsenal do well, I assume. Yeah. And again, it's like Man City lose and you'd enjoy that. And again, Tottenham lose and I, I'd enjoy that as well. And that's like a big part of the thing. And it's kind of a self kind of reinforcing cycle where you have people flock to the channel when they lose. And then the channel was accused of profiting from Arsenal being rubbish. But I genuinely believe they'd still be there if it hadn't blown up. But it would just be on a lower scale. It would just be like the other fan channel. So there's one West Ham called Hammers Chat, which is totally different. They do fan cams and stuff like that, but they do content throughout the week. It's on a much lower budget. They don't really have sponsors. They get like 50 quid a week from one football. And they're there and they've got like a decent following on YouTube, but it's like nothing major. It's like thousands, not hundreds of thousands. And they still do it because they love what they do. And again, like I make podcasts and not many people listen to them, but I still make them because I enjoy making them. So I do believe that the characters on AFTV are invested. I just think it's embellished. It's like I've never walked out. And again, there have been some pretty terrible West Ham matches. But I've never walked out of a West Ham match and said some of the things these people have said. But again, you stick a camera in front of someone and you ask them the right kind of questions and then you get that response, don't you? So again, it's exaggerated, but people enjoy it. And that's the thing, like you can't be overly critical of something that so many people enjoy, whether or not it's for the right reasons or not. So I think mainstream media may be the first to kind of criticize it, but then the other people may be just there like watching it for entertainment. Because if you're not an Arsenal fan, and you support like like and you watch football, you're probably gonna be there like, oh shit, this is gonna be a fun watch for this evening. Like I think a fair few of us know what we're getting into when we're watching it. Like we don't really care. We just want to watch have our laugh and then carry on with whatever we're doing. Of course, you you're not watching whether it be AFTV or Red Devils or whatever channel for high level analysis, are you? You know what you're going there for. And again, it's like when when you talk about the mainstream media, people kind of talk about Sky presenters, they're talking about Neville, they're talking about Carragher. And of course, these are ex-professional footballers. They're friends with people at the club. And especially with the Arsenal people as well. You have AFTV who have been very critical of Arsenal top to bottom, like the board, successive managers, lots of players. And again, and this is what Robbie said as well. He was like, yeah, lots of people watch it because and kind of like our best or most viewed content is when we do badly. But these same guys who are often accused of just being like doom merchants, when they win, they're ecstatic. Yeah. And like, even though there's players that they don't like as footballers, there's lots of players that they absolutely adore. And like, you only have to look at when Sanchez was kind of at his kind of peak at Arsenal. They were going crazy for Sanchez. But of course, people don't remember that because that's not the content that you go to AFTV for. You go to AFTV when they lose 2-0 to Stoke is, is the difference. So like, and again, you were talking about self-driving cars two weeks ago by the time this is published. Yeah. And like, obviously, when they crash, more people are going to talk about them because people want to say, well... Let's not do that because that's that's a terrible idea. But of course, it's just more high profile, isn't it? It's like Arsenal lose. Yeah. You watch AFTV, Arsenal win, not really that bothered. And someone I'll mention as well, I probably wouldn't say this to his face, but Roy Keane is the TV equivalent of an AFTV. Like, I can't remember which Manchester United game it was, but when he basically said that he'd punch De Gea or, or whoever it was. It was sensational TV, but I was watching it thinking, like, this this wouldn't look out of place on a fan channel. And again, that's not to discredit fan channels. It was just so far away from kind of quote-unquote mainstream media that it was just ludicrous. And again, he was saying these ridiculous things. And again, in that match, Manchester United were pretty bad. I remember watching it thinking, this is, this is not good. And again, it was kind of juxtaposed by Spurs. Again, that was the context as well. It's like Spurs aren't very good and you still look pretty bad defensively and De Gea had a shocker but it's just like this player has done so so much for your club and you're standing there saying all these things it was just so just breaking the norms of journalism and that's why people like watching Roy Keane because Roy Keane is like a TV guilty pleasure isn't it it's like <laughs> he's on Sky and then you kind of have him and you have him next to Carragher who will do the proper analysis and then you have Roy <laughs> Keane just like firing abuse mainly at Manchester United players or I mean, particularly Paul Pogba is kind of his favourite one to pick on, isn't it? And again, that's not to discredit Roy Keane. People like it, people watch it. Yeah. And with Roy Keane as well, it's an act, isn't it? That's not, that isn't Roy Keane. You wouldn't, that's not how he would normally behave. It's embellished. Do you think? Yeah. I, Roy Keane is that kind of character. I have yeah. no doubt. I have no doubt that's what he really thinks. But he, he sits there. And again, we all have this opportunity, don't we? We can all sit there and think about what we say. And again, we do this when we make, like on my podcast, we make predictions. And I think what will get people talking. So I, okay, I, I, yeah, think, yeah. I, I think I wrote an article where I, I said that, again, this wasn't that controversial, but I said 
um, the new Seattle NHL team will win the Stanley Cup before 2030 and they only join the league, I think, next year. Mm-hmm. And things like this. Pe- like, you get people talking about it, don't you? And Roy King could have sat there and said something about kind of David Ayer, not very good in goal, we should probably move on. Instead, he just basically went after his character. And again, you see this a lot on Twitter. One of the, the person I do the politics podcast with, I absolutely don't condone the things that he says on Twitter. He says outrageous things on Twitter about Chelsea players and about Kepper and about kind of trying to drive people out of the club. And you talk to him on the pol- you listen to the politics podcast and he sounds like a totally reasonable guy. And again, he does it for retweets. And again, I've said this to right, him. It's like, right. like, we need, like, you need to dial this down. It's ridiculous. And again, people make that decision, don't they? It's like, how far are you willing to go? And again, it's like, what are you trying to achieve? If you're trying to bring attention or trying to be a success in one way, then that's fine. It just depends what your goal is. And like, as I said with the Robbie interview, like I wasn't willing to do the whole, how much do you love Arsenal? Are you a real fan? Do you regret some of the things? Like, it was just pointless. Like we needed to ask different and important questions. And I think if people are going to take the bore seriously, then we had to. Mm, And I think, again, people don't look at Roy Keane as a serious pundit. I think people look at Roy Keane as the guy who shouts. And again, people love Roy Keane. So it's a winner, isn't it? Like people aren't going to forget him. And it plays off. And again, it kind of plays off his character on the pitch. Because if Roy Keane sat there in the studio and was like very kind of methodical and very kind of straight laced, people would go, well, where was the kind of crazy Irish footballer who just stormed around the midfield and was this like brilliant, scary captain? Like Mm. he's got to recreate that. Otherwise, he's no longer Roy Keane. He's trying to keep that memory alive. So yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It just depends where you want to go. You see the difference between like the official Sky Sports and fan TV stuff, like the stuff on YouTube is I feel like you can connect more to the YouTube stuff compared to like the, for example, the Sky Sports and TV stuff. Because the Sky Sports and them, are, they're like, I guess, out of touch kind of in a sense, because they were players, they've been professional their whole lives. Whereas the fans there, you can at least relate to them a little bit. So when Troops is saying some stuff, you can at least, you know, find it like hilarious or like, oh, bro, I used to get bullied in school for being an Arsenal fan. Or, you know, I used to be the bully people, blah, blah, blah. Like you could... You can relate to it in that sense. There, whereas in terms of football, like you may or you may have the same passion for a club, but I don't know if you can relate to it. At least for me, that it could be different for both of you. But I, I don't know because like... relatable, yeah, because they're a fellow fan and you're not. You haven't been a footballer, but then I don't know. I'd rather listen to Gary Neville like speak about May United than I would some like random fan. I think as well, it's about people sounding like you, and again, you can relate more to people on. We use AFTV as an example because they are real people. They're not there to look good on broadcast television. They don't have to play by those rules. Hmm. And again, you think about how you feel after watching Man U lose. You're going to be annoyed. You're not going to be happy about it. And then you kind of watch, watch the coverage afterwards and you see Gary Neville sat there and just say, well, it's not really good enough. Kind of when Bissaka needs to attack more, kind of whatever it might be. And it's like, yeah, that, that's true. But it's not really what I'm looking for on like an emotional level. And you look at these characters on, I keep calling them characters. It's not because I think they're acting. It's just because, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, it's just it's like... Personalities. Yeah, like you, you see the personality in them, don't you? And TV, it's all about kind of the mode in which you receive the information. And again, Robbie did, has done a documentary about racism in football. He's had a TV series, which to be honest, I wasn't aware of at the time. And it doesn't try, it's not the same, is it? Because you're playing by different conventions. Yeah. So it's like one thing that works brilliant on YouTube, you then kind of transfer it across and it's a bit weird. And one of, one of the examples is kind of Spencer Owen, who did, they had him on Sky quite a lot. And it was like this attempt to bridge the gap between YouTube and TV to bring people back over to TV, essentially. And it's just like people looked at it and it's like, why, why have we got some YouTuber on there? And again, people just try and put them in a box. I think Robbie is kind of because of how big the channel was grown and how influential it is, he's kind of grown beyond that. But a lot of people kind of then just get kind of cast into this group and it's like, this is what you are, this is what you do. Um, and it's about kind of trying to move across those things. And I think yeah. a lot of the time TV looks at the success of YouTube channels and what they achieve try to recreate it but it's too professional people want something different and that's why partly podcasts are so successful because you can sit there and watch it when it will listen to it whenever you like and youtube is so interesting because you can do the same staying on topic of youtube we recently found out that jeremy lynch was the greatest player of the arsenal uh, invincible squad at the time <laughs> um yeah i only know like bits and pieces of this so for those who don't know jeremy lynch is part of the duo from the f2 freestylers which i believe is the biggest football youtube channel but anyway a video came out recently on twitter where jeremy lynch i don't know how much of it was like a joke or how much it's been serious but everyone took it serious and the medium like a meme uh where he said that 
because he used to be in the Arsenal Academy when he was younger. And then he said he was told at the time he was the best player they had at the club on the ball, but off the ball, he was the worst. And for that reason, apparently he was released, which is ridiculous. You're not going to release like an academy player just because they're bad off the ball if you're so good off it. But there's been a lot of controversy with him for quite a while now. I guess he's not a very likable person in the YouTube space. It was related to the Wembley Cup a couple of years back. There's a series called the Wembley Cup. It's basically YouTubers kind of creating up a football teams, kind of all created by this guy called Spencer. Pot has his own team called Hashtag, Hashtag United, I think. What happened was they were doing a group stage in the third year of the Wembley Cup, I believe. And yeah, so they were playing EXO. So EXO is a joke team, basically. It has people like Steven Tries in it, True Geordie and a few others. And EXO were winning somehow. And obviously everyone was having a laugh because like, if you have Steven Tries and someone on the team and you're winning, against F2 of all people like because F2 are known as like come on like they're, like they're best on YouTube right so everyone was obviously losing their shit and in the second half basically was cut off early and it was basically led to multiple jokes so like back and forth between I guess Jeremy from what we could see Jeremy and Spencer so Spencer was like oh you only care about the followers like you could hear these like subtle, subtle re- remarks in the, like the videos like and we didn't know what was joke what was like professional what was part of the entertainment and then on the last thing when I think F2 won Jeremy Lynch in the post-match interview goes on the mic and he says that's what happens when you we play with referees that aren't on Spencer's payroll drops the mic and leaves yeah and that was like the start of basically where everything was started to like I guess come out into the public eye so I think it all started kicking off after the Stephen tries happy hour interview and he just was openly speaking about it, and that's when everyone yeah started giving out all this information that basically not not F2 as a whole but usually Jeremy Lynch was more tough to work with than anything. But then an email was sent by someone who was working, I guess, close to the like official referee team. And it basically says that the referee was may have been a fan of the F2 or something, but they were getting so annoyed at how much they were being dickheads to them in the game that he said he's going to cut the second half short. And he cut it at 13 minutes out of 15. And then everyone else was told to clear the stopwatch or whatever. And then obviously Spencer didn't know, but Spencer was obviously fighting alongside the F2, but he obviously took a lot of the blame because... F2 just weren't having it. Then there's obviously a lot of other things attacking Jeremy Lynch's character. Jeremy Lynch no longer has Twitter so on. Even though it was for charity, etc. Like it seemed like basically they were just going around flaunting and just trying to like be dickheads at the end of it. Yeah, Luke, do you know much about any of that? Yeah, the issue... So what happened when kind of Hamish was covered? And the accusation that the F2 made was that Spencer was bent and was trying to break the tournament. And... This was the last one. I think there was either four or three. And Spencer's team, Hashtag United, had won all of the previous competitions. So everyone was like, well, this is clearly right. Which, of course, Hashtag United profusely kind of reject. And the referee stopped the game two minutes early. And kind of that meant that they lost to XO, which as I watched at the time, it was it was really funny. And I just thought that that was quite amusing anyway. By the sounds of it, the ultimate story is Jeremy is just not very nice to work with. And again, like... You have whatever you do, whether you're at uni, whether you're in like full time employment, whatever, you're going to come across people who you just hate working with because they're a bit of an ass. And it kind of, yeah, that is what it is. But it was just funny as well. And kind of the, the major controversy that came out of it was obviously this two minutes. And it then emerged that the referee cut the game short by two minutes because the F2 were horrible to the referees. And again, I, I, I referee on a Sunday, kind of, I've done men's football, I do kids' football whatever will pay me more essentially um <laughs> if i'm being honest and you get that a lot and it, I, I tweeted this i think yesterday it's like as a referee the only way you get any respect is if you do your job properly hmm. so like i've had games where i've been like vociferously abused by both teams at very important so like especially kids football so as soon, whatever team's losing you're going to get stick off of a the parents especially from kind of, so when i referee up um, back in Essex, East London, uh, well, a lot Shut of games are actually in East London because of the league I played in. You get a lot, lot more abuse from the players. In so I'm still in Coventry now. In Coventry, it's mainly the parents. It's not so much the players. Okay. Um, and you get this stick, and it's like whatever team's losing essentially. So if you have a game that's like one nil to one team, then it switches to two one, then it switches to three two. Like you're just getting pummeled from both sides. Whatever you do. And kind of the parents, when it gets high scoring, get really, really into it. The players get really into it. And it, they, they act like it's the World Cup final. In reality, it's the Coventry and Warwickshire Youth Football League. Let's <laughs> chill. <laughs> yeah. And like, you get more and more into it. You get to the full-time whistle. And pre, obviously, pandemic, you shake everyone's hands, you walk off, and like everyone's 
super happy most of the time. And to be honest, I think I'm quite a, a good ref anyway. I'm quite kind of confident in my decisions and I explain stuff and I just don't take any nonsense. Yeah. Like, especially when I do kids football. If a kid swears at me, I just book them. <laughs> like, I give them one. I like bring them over. Whatever, whatever I'm going to do, I bring them over. I say, look, this is unacceptable. Do it again, I'll book you. And then normally they turn around and call me a twat or whatever. So I just book them. And it's really that simple. And then kind of you end the match and everyone's happy because you've ref a good game. And it's fine. And you just need to be able to take it. And this ref, kind of in this example, has just totally lost the plot. And what's happened, yeah. and I say this as a referee, what has happened is he's looked at it, even though he's an FA accredited referee. And again, that's, that's not a high bar to set because you could do a six hour course and be an FA accredited referee. It's not, it's not difficult. I just sat there and thought, this isn't a real game of football. This is kind of a fake tournament for YouTube or kind of a, just a, a small tournament that doesn't really count for much. Yeah. It's just gone, look, I've had enough. And again, that's totally wrong. And what I think is even worse about the situation are the other officials who cleared their watches. Yeah. That's unacceptable. That's not okay. Yeah. Um, but that's what happened. They've just looked at it and said, yeah, I'm, I'm done with it. And that's really bad because they're there to do a job. And yeah, it's just disappointing to hear that kind of from a referee's perspective. And kind of there was a video that um, they released on Spencer's channel where his brother Seb said, look, well, I always thought referees were honest. And now I feel like does Howard Webb give more penalties to Man United? And yeah. as a referee, that's really disappointing to hear because... My perspective is I honestly could not care any less who wins. I'm essentially here to run around for an hour, go home with 30 quid. That's as much as I care. It's fine, whatever. And part of the job is taking the abuse. And that's a horrible thing to say, but it kind of has to be in your temperament that you need to be able to handle that. Because if you become a referee and you're rattled by a 16-year-old calling you a tosser, <laughs> then it's not going to end well, essentially. And I feel like that's what happened. Like he's just at the end of his table with the F2 and he's just called the game early. I, I still can't justify I haven't finished the final video that I think I need to watch on it. I think the email about all of this owning up, I'm like, as we were saying in the previous, earlier this episode and previous episodes, like one bad egg is all it takes for everything to be seen in a bad light. And there's like nothing. It's not easy to repair that, you know, like it's just tarnished afterwards. Yeah. The upshot of it is, he just didn't respect the competition. Not, and again, I'm not trying to defend the referee who did it or any of the officials that were complicit. But I'm absolutely sure that if it was a real game, kind of in inverted commas, they wouldn't have done it because yeah. they would have felt that it was more serious and kind of like they would have they would have cared more. Ultimately, they just didn't respect the competition. And for the sake of two minutes, it's just that's the thing. Like two minutes, and again, as a referee, part of your job is about kind of handling the tempo of the game and. So, for example, I did a kind of adult county cup semi-final. And whenever you get into a, the latter stage of the cup competition, people get so into it and they bring fans and it's just a bit crazy. And like it, it normally gets quite violent, essentially. So the way you manage that is just by booking someone in the fifth minute, but shoving someone unnecessarily. And then people tend to calm down. And it's about game management. And I, I can't remember the footage from the XO game, but like... If a team is so badly on your back, you just need to do something that's like, no, I'm just not accepting this. It's just like, it was just ridiculously managed. And again, it's like, it could have been that simple. It was just a case of like a massive PR own goal. And um, yeah, I think people just need to chill out, essentially. I think that's the moral of the story. But yeah, I wanted to move on to, we were talking about like the referee maybe not doing his job. And Hamish mentioned like tarnishing a reputation. Um, Lionel Messi, I don't know. Uh, what your thoughts are on this but he recently decided he wanted to leave Barcelona this year after I don't know however many years now recently made a bit of a U-turn on it and decided he's going to stay for the year and yeah I, th I think there's there's a few like contrasting views I saw Gary Lineker have a bit of a Twitter argument with a guy from May United's fan channel yesterday where Gary Lineker is more of the opinion that you know Messi's done so much for Barcelona he has a right to like choose his next destination leave when he wants um, and then you got the opposing view where, you know, he's a footballer, he's been paid so much money, he shouldn't really not turning up for training. Yeah, what, what were your thoughts on that, Luke? I, oh, it's tricky because ultimately the situation was just handled ridiculously. Like, yeah. the easiest thing in the world to do would have been for Barcelona just to say, yeah, we'll sell you for 100 million plus Jesus, Garcia, and I think it was Bernardo Silva they were talking about as well. And then what would have happened is you would have taken the wage off of kind of 
And Messi's wage is a huge financial drag on Barcelona. So that would have freed them up massively. You would have brought in three really good players and you could have started something new. And instead, they've kind of pursued this line of keeping him at the club against his will. And the conclusion of this was basically Messi still thinks he has the right to leave, but he doesn't want to drag Barcelona through the courts, which is fair enough. And I kind of see both sides. So like, I'm, I'm not of the opinion that we should kind of feel sorry for Messi because he's not allowed to leave. Yeah, yeah on a free transfer because ultimately he's the in my opinion anyway he's the best player in the world and ever essentially and he's under contract and i don't really expect it would be hugely embarrassing to barcelona if they lost the best player ever on a free transfer with a year left on his contract technically i don't know why they would ever agree to a break clause yeah in his contract in the first place that makes no sense so I don't feel that sorry for Messi. At the same time, I don't feel that sorry for Barcelona and the fact that he wanted to leave. I feel like he wants to leave. So either you need to determine whether or not the clause exists or whether it's valid. And then you need to decide what you're going to do about it because Barcelona could have just sold the player and then it would have all been over. And I think I, I'm reluctant to be like speak in like final terms on this because I don't think it's over. I think if Man City submit an offer that's good enough, I think he'll still go this year. And I think he will definitely leave next year if not signing a new deal. Yeah, I just think again, this is just really bad PR for everyone. It's just like they could have done this quietly and moved on and it would have been fine. Instead you have this ridiculous kind of psychodrama where Messi's trying to force a move. And again, I I'm someone who doesn't like and again, I feel like I'm going to upset you both now. I don't really like Cristiano Ronaldo. I think he's just arrogant and... Oh, it doesn't hurt me that much. I'm not that invested. <laughs> no, that's right. But like, low, I, low key I'm, hurts me, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm not kind of big on Ronaldo. And again, it, like, kind of talking about kind of the sports athletes that I like the most. Like I love Roger Federer. And I, I really have quite a visceral dislike for Novak Djokovic, although that's partly for like non-tennis reasons anyway. Yeah, um, fair enough. So it's like, I like these characters. But again, Messi, this situation looks bad on him. Like not turn it. He should have turned up for training, absolutely. But again, that was partly because he believed he wasn't a Barcelona player. So technically, he thought he was a free agent anyway. I know. Speaking from like someone who has it, doesn't you know? Like sometimes there could be like too much discrepancy between all the parties involved in making this stuff happen. So he could have just been under the impression. Like I don't know. I'm not justifying what he did, by the way. Just to clarify, I just I would just say like, what if he didn't know about X Y Z in his contract, and he thought that oh yeah shit this year I can go ahead sign for Man City. You know, something like that. Uh, but on the Cristiano Ronaldo point, I did want to just quickly add before we go back to this. The only reason I think Cristiano Ronaldo may be better than Messi is because he's done it in multiple leagues. That's the difference between him and Messi. But I don't have enough of a deeper understanding of football to justify this. What I would counter that with is a lot of people only remember Cristiano Ronaldo as being Real Madrid Cristiano Ronaldo. And again, you're a Manchester United fan, so you probably won't agree. Yeah. But I think the wider non kind of man centric kind of fan thinks of Ronaldo as a Real Madrid player. You don't necessarily think of him as this player who conquered England. Although, of course, he was great in the Premier League, but he made his name in Spain. And you've got Messi, who, if he stays this year and actually plays, he'll break Pelé's record for most goals at a single club. And again, we talk a lot about loyalty in football. And if you have, like, I'll, I'll concede, one of the two best players in the world who stays his whole career at a single club, that's like quite a big achievement still yeah that's... i'm not that I, to be honest i really don't care about the messi v ronaldo debate <laughs> yeah, like yeah. if given the if given the choice between watching messi or ronaldo i'd pick messi but I'm, i don't really care like I, i'm more bothered about kind of with west ham resign <laughs> colton cole yeah my, my only contribution to ronaldo messi thing is uh I'm, I'm a massive heart overhead guy so i'm choosing ronaldo every day of the week <laughs> but um I also do think the argument where like people consider him more the Real Madrid player, like, yeah, he spent most of his career there and broke massive records. Yeah, won number of Ballon d'Ors. I, th I think people are quick to forget, though, he did win his first Ballon d'Or in England at May United. Like, I've, I've seen a lot of debates recently where it's like, oh, who's the best like foreign Premier League player to like play in the Premier League or the best player to play in the Premier League? But they often are very quick to just dismiss Ronaldo because he wasn't at his peak at May United. But I'd still argue his May United peak was better than most players' peaks in the Premier League but yeah I'd say the two best players ever to live so I think I think that's also another point like whatever happens from this Messi situation I think it's massively disappointing for someone who is widely considered as the greatest player ever like I, d I wonder how Barcelona fans feel um, like this guy they've worshipped and how they'll kind of respond to him I just think it's a really like unfortunate and disappointing like potentially like what well, he's 33 now last few years of his career maybe aren't gonna it's just gonna be a bit of tarnish on his career, I guess. It will hurt Messi's reputation as well because he's always been this holier-than-thou figure. 
And yeah. especially when people juxtapose him with Ronaldo, who is perceived to be arrogant, whether or not that's true or not, is a different thing. But kind of Messi's whole image, Messi doesn't actually really have an image. Like Messi doesn't yeah. do interviews. Like he did the interview with Goal this week, didn't he? Or, but he doesn't really do interviews. He doesn't really do many adverts. I think he did Pepsi at one point, didn't he? And obviously he does kind of his deal with, hmm. with his kit sponsors. But other than that, he doesn't really do much. He just, people know Messi because he's a great footballer and, and that's it. Whereas you look at kind of other figures, you look at Ibrahimovic, people know who Ibrahimovic is because he's kind of outrageous things and, 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 it, and can back it up on the pitch as well. People know Cristiano Ronaldo because he's hugely kind of renowned for doing lots of adverts and doing quite a few interviews. Like Chris MD has interviewed Ronaldo. Ronaldo is not somebody who shies away from the press. How crazy um, he has us all. Yeah. yeah. So like there's a very, very different approach. And I feel like Messi has always kind of built his figure on just being a footballer and I feel like this detracts from it slightly which is disappointing to see and if he leaves at the end of the year obviously where where could you see him going because I can't see anywhere but Man City I was going to ask you like what's the stop him from going like Juve like everyone always says Man City because of the money but like what's the stop him from because has he said explicitly that he wants to go to an, uh, the what is it the English Premier League I, I just can't see him at Juve like, I just can't no. picture it what if he did it for the for the bands? Like, or like, do you know that kind of thing? Like the two best players at the um, one club for one year or something, and then he f's off to wherever else. I honestly don't think they could afford him. Yeah. But you can't afford Messi and Ronaldo. That's just ridiculous. But the revenue they'll still get, like, not like they're going to throw it away, right? They're surely going to get a good amount of revenue from that. No, people say this, and people often talk about shirt sales. Mm-hmm. But clubs tip the average amount a football club earns from a single shirt sale is five pounds. Oh, wow! Right, right. So you'd have to sell like triple the record amount so like when people like the really lazy comment that you see in journalism a lot is all oh, shirt sales will pay for this when that couldn't be further from the truth it's like completely ridiculous like shirt sales might pay for i don't know manuel lanzini to west ham it's not paying Lionel messi's wages this is so i have quite a eclectic interest in terms of like leagues i watch so like i really love north american sports well, I, I love ice hockey. So I watch MLS a lot, uh, Major League Soccer. So like, I'm really like actively interested in that. I write about it quite a lot. I was going to say Messi could go to like an Inter Miami or something. I could foresee that. Yeah. But what about his kids? Like, don't, won't his kids' future matter? Like, because obviously his kids may be settled into school. I don't know how old his kids are, if he has any. But I would assume like that's going to play a big factor, right? Where, to, where they can migrate to. Mm. I don't know much kind of about his kids, but I think I've, I listened to something or read something the other day where basically... Actually, it was um, a clip on Sky that I saw on Twitter, which basically the one of the presenters basically said, well, Messi had this chat with his wife and kids and they were like all crying saying, like, please don't leave Barcelona. Whether or not that's true or not is a different thing. But at the end of the day, he's a professional footballer. He earns a ridiculous amount of money. I don't think these kids are going to struggle to settle into yeah. <laughs> to wherever they go to. They're going to be living the life, aren't they? The only thing that concerns me about the Messi to Man City link is they talk a lot about kind of him going to Man City and then, you know, City own lots of clubs around the world. They own yeah. NYCFC in, in MLS. The issue with, with that, and they talk about kind of Messi going to Man City and then being kind of switched over to New York for a season, is New York City FC play at a baseball field. And it would really, really upset me if Messi finished his career <laughs> in going to America's fine. I would love to see him play in MLS. But if he goes to America to play on like one of the only kind of stadiums in the league that, that isn't actually for football would be awful and it's just a terrible pitch and it would be really upsetting but no I, I think the Messi thing's interesting as well because it shows how big and complicated kind of the the law side of it is I've been trying to get an interview with and again this is just because we know him one of the guys who runs like Watford's legal team and of course there's like so much that goes into it and you see like lots of lots more examples of people trying to take each other to court in football like Antonio Conte suing Chelsea and this kind of stuff Hmm. Um, and Lionel Messi potentially trying to sue his way out of being a Barcelona player. And I think kind of a definitely kind of post-pandemic as well, we're going to see a shift away from transfers to running down your contract and leaving. I think that's going to be something that we're going to see more because people aren't going to want to pay the transfer fee. And again, it works for the players as well, because if you don't pay transfer fees, players typically get a better signing on bonus anyway. So if you leave Manchester United... On it. So like Ander Herrera left on the free, I think, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He would have got a massive sign on, on fee at, at Paris Saint-Germain just because they didn't have to pay a transfer fee. Yeah. And I think that could be something that's that's quite interesting as well. I think, what do you think of like the accusations where Messi kind of just throws a strop when it's not going well? 
I, I think there's something to that. <laughs> a quote I saw as well was like, Messi is afraid to go to a different league because he's always had it set at Barcelona. He's always been like, he was the wonder kid. Then he was kind of the next best thing. And then he was the best thing and he still is the best thing. Like he's always been the center of attention at Barcelona. Um, he's the captain and kind of, he's often accused of running the show at Barcelona, which I don't, act, I don't, I don't believe Messi runs the show necessarily. I think um, it has a massive influence though. Well, you would do, you would do as that, the best player. Yeah. Yeah. But what I don't like is when people try to blame Messi for the fact that Barcelona have gone downhill. I think the only mm. way you can blame Messi for that is the fact that his wages are too big for Barcelona to be able to afford a, a squad that actually works. Yeah. Did sorry? Did they not like buy like Griezmann and like Coutinho and all this stuff? So like, all these wages also impacting them? Because they basic, as far as I'm aware, like I'm not too familiar with the Barca squad, but isn't all those like, very expensive wages that they have going on there as well? Yeah, no, definitely. But Messi's wage is it's like 500k a week, I think. Something is in wow. that kind of region. Right. So yeah, like the difference between a Messi and a Griezmann is huge. Like even it, so, like a club the size of Barcelona would expect to spend 200k a week on a player. As soon as you start spending like 500k a week on a player, that obviously becomes hugely problematic if you're not winning. If you're winning Champions Leagues, it's not so much of an issue. But if you're not winning it, it's kind of drains resources away from elsewhere. And people look at Barcelona and they say, well, and again, the investments have been quite bad. Like Antonio Griezmann hasn't been very good for Barcelona. Luis Suarez is now 33 and they're desperately trying to get rid of him. Like Barcelona has not been particularly run well. To answer the question about kind of his messy spoil in the sense that he just kind of quits when they lose there's definitely something to that on an international level this is a guy who's retired from his national team twice i, I totally agree that he looks ridiculous for doing that and that, that's just silly yeah. to be honest like he retired after losing the Copa america and then retired after losing the world cup final and that that's just that's again it's just silly in terms of club stuff i don't i think it's different with clubs because Messi doesn't have there's no like divine right in Barcelona that means that they have to have Messi for his whole career and like numerous times Messi's kind of agitated for a move and they've just given him a new contract I think this is the first time he's actually been serious about leaving Barcelona I think before it was I'll just go for a wage rise and I think now he's genuinely just wants out but yeah I, I do agree with you about kind of retiring from international teams I think to do that twice, both of the times because the team isn't very good, is is not a great look, is it? No, no. And again, as I say, I I, I would pick Messi over Ronaldo personally, but um, a series that we did, I always say we when really it's kind of <laughs> I did it um, <laughs> for the ball when I was made editor. I started this thing called Great Debates, where basically we'd debate different topics in sport, and we'd have two authors. And like the obvious place to start was Messi v Ronaldo. I ended up writing the Ronaldo side of it just because no one else wanted to, which Again, kind of blew my mind. But, oh, should have called uh, that one. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really strange. But yeah, in this article, I spoke about Ronaldo. Like internationally, you can't fault him because it's like like Portugal. I think if you play Portugal versus Argentina, Argentina should win every time. Yeah, especially kind of in 2016 or 2018 when Portugal won the European Championships, whenever it was. But like Ronaldo drags that team, and Ronaldo is like a true leader in that way. Whereas Messi trying to lead by example. And that can only take you so far if the rest of your team isn't isn't that good. Yeah, one one uh, last thing on that, I think, and kind of transitioning into the next bit is, uh, so I saw the argument with when Bruno Fernandes joined and there was a lot of comparisons like, oh, Bruno Fernandes, do we need Paul Pogba, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, I saw one guy who made the point that he felt Pogba improves a good team, but Bruno Fernandes makes a bad team good. And with the whole Ronaldo Messi thing, maybe especially of late, I think you can maybe draw comparisons of that. With Ronaldo would make a bad team good, but Messi would just make a good team great. If that makes you sense. You heard it here first. Aaron said Bruno Fernandes is like Ronaldo. No, no, no. I mean, like I mean on their like effect on the, I mean on their effects on the team. Um, like Ronaldo will drag a bad team to make him into a good team where Messi might not necessarily do that. Is it true that they tried to build a team purely around Messi? Is this true or like... I mean, you'd imagine so. I think you've got to, haven't yeah. you? Like, why would why would you? I mean, if it kind of going on, kind of a more kind of tactical in depth look, if you look at the way that the Barcelona defend, like Messi doesn't really do any defending, so obviously the you then have to have a situation where you find a way of reinforcing wherever he plays. So it's like if he plays on the right, which is where Messi should play, then you need to make sure that your right back doesn't attack because then he needs to sit back and kind of watch that side of the pitch so then you don't get overloaded. The issue that Barcelona have is that Nelson Semedo, who plays right back for Barcelona, 
can't really defend. So you have a situation where Messi doesn't defend, Semedo doesn't defend, and then then you're you're really in trouble. And the classic ex- example of this as well is when you look at whether it be kind of you guys work in tech, like you need people who are good at different things. Mm-hmm. And but also you need to have a team that kind of is interchangeable. So look at West Ham for example. Our two left backs are Aaron Cresswell and Arthur Masuaku. They have no similarities. So if you take one out and put the other one in, you totally have to change the whole way you do something. Whereas what you should do is have two players who are vaguely similar and can do the same job. So like say you're not in, then you can just bring someone in from another desk and they can do your job for the day. Like that's the issue that you get. So when you build a team around someone, you really need to be sure that it's going to work. And you see this a lot in sports where they have a salary cap. And I think the best way to look at football as well is to pretend that you have a salary cap. Just pretend that your budget is a salary cap, because essentially it is. So then if you're going to spend X amount on Lionel Messi, then you need to make sure that there's good value everywhere else in the squad. And I think kind of, say you put him into Manchester City and (laughs) you have De Bruyne feeding the ball to Messi, kind of puts the ball on a plate for Aguero. it, It can't be bad, can it? Yeah, I'd be afraid. I'd be scared if I saw that, to be honest. Um, as a Man United fan. But like Man City, with or without Messi, I do have them predicted to win the league next year. So when this comes out, the weekend this comes out is the weekend the Premier League starts. So I thought we'd have a little like preview of that. I guess best place to start is maybe just like what we think for the league positions wise. Okay, I'm going to prefix this with uh, I'm going to be very biased here. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to be. Also, yeah, go on. Also, make sure you check out Fantasy League whilst you're as well. Third wheel fantasy. Yeah, league. yeah, we'll uh, put a link in the description to that and. Uh, I'll give it a shout out at the end as well. So first, I've personally gone Manchester City. Luke, who do you reckon will finish top of the table? This is my rogue moment of the podcast. I'm actually going to go Chelsea because I really like their transfers. I, I... Hamish, who are you saying? Look, yeah, um, I would want, I would want United to win, but I think realistically it's going to be like a C. I don't okay, know. yeah, I... but Chelsea. I wouldn't put it past Chelsea to be really high up there based on what I've heard of transfers this season. Yeah, Chelsea's. See, I, I just. They've basically got a whole half of their first 11 has changed since last year. So I just think that could take a bit of time where I think in the like looking at City and Liverpool now, you really can't slip up a whole season. So if City, although looking at Chelsea's fixtures, they've got a pretty good start first, like five, four games is pretty decent. So they could very well hit the ground running. The reason I went for Chelsea and I, I, I know it's rogue and logically my prediction makes no sense totally agree what i would say about chelsea is they've really strengthened in the areas that they need to and i'm working on the if they don't buy a goalkeeper they're not going to win the league but I, i'm okay, pretty confident yeah. they will buy someone who's halfway competent the reason that <laughs> i like the obvious two picks are liverpool and city i don't think liverpool do it again because they can't be as good as last year or the year before and they've not really signed anyone yet if they sign tiago that might change mm. but there's not really done much obviously they signed that left back but he's not going to be first choice anyway the reason i don't like city this year as well is Obviously, City were great last year, but they weren't on the level of a Liverpool. And you look at the Champions League where the wheels have kind of started to fall off for for Guardiola. I'm just not sure they're going to have enough. I think this is going to be, uh, I think it's going to be the first time in a while where the top two aren't massively ahead of the rest. Yeah, I agree. Because I think Liverpool, I think Liverpool will get worse quite considerably because, especially with the congestion as well, because Klopp plays such kind of a high-paced style of football that is really difficult to sustain. And I just feel like Chelsea are the team out of kind of the rest of the pack that could challenge. And you look at the squad, look at the players they've signed, like Thiago Silva playing in the Premier League. I know he's 36, but how good was he in the Champions League final? And it's not often you kind of look at someone who loses as a defender and you still say had a really good game. Yeah. Timo Werner, who logically should be very good. I'm slightly afraid that he might flop. Kai Havertz it's just it's just a really really interesting it's like they're playing career mode isn't it yeah it's a bit it's it, a bit unfair it, it to really... I'm like <laughs> they missed out on one transfer window so they've just decided uh, yeah just to go ham this year but I, I rate it just because like at least so you know how we're just used to hearing all sorts of rumours Chelsea are the only team actually basically I feel like I've done something that you know, every time I hear a Chelsea transfer now I feel like it's going to be legit now at this point because they've actually went out and gone like how many five six players and like I don't know how often you go around buying five, six players at a transfer season, but I don't think it's that frequent. I've right? got it here. So they've brought in Timo Werner from RB Leipzig, Hakim Ziyech from Ajax, Ben Chilwell from Leicester, Malang Saar from Nice, although he's gone back on loan to Nice, Thiago Silva from PSG, and just recently Kai Havertz from Bayer Leverkusen. And then they're not like, they're all top, top quality players. So uh, yeah, they will be interesting. I, I, 
100% agree with you that I think I don't think we're going to have the massive gap we have seen last couple of years or last few years even. To be honest, I wouldn't put it past Chelsea. And looking at, I, I said Man City, but I wouldn't say I'm overly impressed with their transfers in. Um, Nathan Ake, I don't think that's like a game changer bringing him in. And to be honest, I don't know too much about Ferran Torres or uh, Pablo Moreno. So I'm not... Wait, sure. did David Silva retire? He's gone to Sociedad. Yeah, I, th- I think that'll be a miss, but I don't think it'll be like a devastating miss. Like he was being phased out like gradually. And I expect people like Bernardo Silva, Mares, and all that to step up. Liverpool, as you said, not really made a signing. They could bring in Thiago, but bring in Thiago, I think they're losing Wijnaldum, who was, I think, pretty crucial part of their like system. And they're not the same player, so I don't necessarily know how that'll work. And I think I mentioned this before as well. Liverpool, I think they'll just like relax a bit. Like they've achieved what they've been waiting like 30 years to do, I think. So who's your number two then, you guys? So I guess we can start with Luke this time. I've got Liverpool second, personally. I've got Man United. On the, on the <laughs> assumption that we are signing people more people than just Donny van der Beek. <laughs> All right. Third then, Aaron? I've got Liverpool at third. Luke? City. Oh, fourth Luke? Uh, United. Okay, I've got Chelsea at fourth. So we got the same top four. And I do think the gap will be like much closer. At this point, I think that's the obvious top four. I, I think, well, saying Chelsea will win the league is, is definitely rogue. But I think saying that Spurs or Arsenal would finish in the top four is, is not that far off just because of the quality of the other teams. Yeah, Arsenal are a tricky one. I do feel like Arsenal fans, they might hate me for this. I think they're just getting a bit too over overcast <laughs> at the moment. And they need a uh, first time, like, who are they playing first? Let me check. I was going to say, like, I don't think Spurs are going to scrape the top six. I think they're going to come, like, eighth or ninth. I think, like, Wolves and, like, another team may do way better. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, one of those teams that just have pure, more, more heart, I feel like, more aggression. Yeah, so, like, Arsenal got Fulham first game. They'll lose, like, 2-1 to Fulham. <laughs> and it'll, it'll be back down to earth. Um, <laughs> duh, duh. Yeah, yeah, top four. Do, would you have any objections to that top four, Hamish? Anyone you can see getting in? Um... Just the four, not lo- not like fifth or sixth. Yeah, because personally, I wouldn't want Arsenal in their Spurs. Just because they have Mourinho as the manager, I hope they come like eighth or ninth. Otherwise, I- I'm not against like Spurs. United, like, I don't know, like, will they come top four? Like, will we be let down? I don't know. I only can watch the highlights, so I don't have to put myself... My on. my point for Man United was we finished... It's a bit, it's a bit of a tricky one, because we finished third, and I think it looks good, like, finished third, but realistically, we finished with the same amount of points we did the season before, and Chelsea and Leicester pretty much bottled it to let us in we had a great end to the season but having said all that Pogba was out for pretty much the whole season only played mostly towards the end we will have Fernandez for the whole season now Martial and Rashford were both injured for like two months each and still go over 20 goals we've got Mason Greenwood a senior player now for the whole season and I'm still hoping that we'll get Jadon Sancho in whether that will happen or not I don't know actually there is one thing I kind of disagree I think yeah like there's these three teams for some reason in my head that just like I think one of these three is going to come top four and it's just going to be like, not rogue, but it's kind of be like, it's been a long time coming again. It's going to be like either Leicester, Everton or Wolves. Wolves. I don't know why. I just feel like one of them are just going to take out one of the top four spots that you lot have. So speaking of Everton, what, what are we talking about fifth or sixth? Uh, fifth and, so I've got Spurs fifth, Arsenal sixth. Okay. And then I think best of the rest this season is possibly Everton. And I think the reason Everton might finish seventh is because they don't have to play in Europe. Whereas Wolves are uh, Europa League, Leicester, or, oh, oh, I'm not sure. But Leicester are in, obviously, the Europa League. Um, and I think that will be a bit of an issue. So I just feel like Everton's business is really impressive as well. Yeah. And it's kind of, I don't think he's signed yet, but by the time this comes out, he probably would have. Obviously, they've got Hamas Rodriguez. Um, they signed Alan from Napoli. And they've got Carlo. An- I still can't believe Carlo Ancelotti is their manager. Yeah, it's bizarre. It, honestly, yeah. it blows my mind. And I, think, I say this as a dissatisfied West Ham fan. It's just, I look at Everton, like, they are a similar stature of club to West Ham. Mm. And I, I look at them and I say, they've got Richarlison, they've got Ancelotti, they've got kind of all these great players. West Ham have got David Moyes. And it's just like, <laughs> wow, it really does hurt to look at that. Yeah, I think Everton will be good. I think Wolves, I don't think Wolves can sustain it this year. Um, yeah, same. I think it'll be tricky for them. I think people, I think with Wolves... They play such an interesting system that they'll have to be sussed out at some point. And we see this all the time. Like when teams come up and play a different way, people initially don't really know what to do about them. And I think it's going to get to the point where someone works them out. And I think Sheffield United, I think post lockdown, it showed Sheffield United aren't going to be up there next year. They'll be all right, but they're not going to be in like the conversation for Europe for sure. 
But no, I do agree. I think Everton, Everton are exciting. I think Everton are like a truly an unknown quantity. It depends on the defence and goalkeeper situation because I really don't like Pickford. No, same. he really does terrify me. To be honest, I've got just the swap in them places. I've got Arsenal in fifth and Tottenham in sixth. Tottenham at the moment, because Tottenham had a pretty good run under Mourinho, like points wise, even though it might not seem like it. But transfers in, I'm not overly impressed um, or not. They're not like game changing. And I don't know if I can see Mourinho like kicking up a fuss. See, my issue with Spurs is that Mourinho's famous for his park the bus antics here. And basically, I don't think that with that Spurs team, I don't think it will ever work. It may like they may still have some moments, you know, some moments of greatness. But I feel like it's going to be more of a blow this season than for them to be like, as like you say, top six team. I, don't, I just I don't know. Maybe it's my my pure dislike for Mourinho at this point, but yeah, yeah. And I think my my like outside bets were Everton, as you said, brought brought in Alan of Napoli, and looks like they'll bring in Hamas Rodriguez. And I've also gone Leeds as the uh, surprise surprise package. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how Marco Bielsa's uh, football will plan out. And there's always a promoted team that does. Well, funnily enough, it's normally like the playoff team that does well, not the team that wins the championship, I find. But um, yeah, my my shout for that would be Leeds. Looking at relegation, I don't know if I have an exact order for like 18, 19, 20, but I think the teams around there, I feel like Sheffield will drop off a bit this year. I think they've like what they achieved last year was probably no one was expecting it. So I can see them dropping off. Aston Villa haven't brought anyone in. Um, so they'll be around the same place. Brighton, Fulham, West Brom, I think might all be in there with a shout. For me, I think Fulham will go back down because I think they're just kind of a like for like swap with Norwich, unfortunately. And I really, really like Scott yeah, Parker. Yeah, so that's why I didn't uh, didn't want to go for them. Yeah, I think Fulham are going down. I think Newcastle are going down. I think okay. their preseason's been pretty bad. They lost five two to Middlesbrough. I think I know it's only preseason, but that's quite worrying. And they're not really spending any money because Ashley's obviously trying to sell the club. And then this year is is going to be the year that. West Ham are relegated for me personally. Um, really? Okay. See, my my, I was tempted to put West Ham, but I thought, okay, you've got one of the worst starts going from your first like opening fixtures. I don't know. Well, we're playing. I think five of the top six in our first seven games. Okay. Yeah, you've got Newcastle, then Arsenal, Wolves, Leicester, Tottenham, Man City, Liverpool. So we'll go into November potentially having four points at most. And again, I'm quite well. I feel like I'm quite realistic with West Ham. I'm not infused particularly by David Moyes. I kind of look at him. Well, you'll have experience. I forget it was a man new manager, wasn't he? Yeah, he's okay. He's a sticking plaster solution. I just don't trust him in the long run. And ultimately, the issue at West Ham isn't isn't the manager. It's it's not the players. It's the owners. It's it's really ridiculously badly run. And I look at the squad, and we ended like I don't know how closely you watched West Ham in the season last year, but we ended the season playing a four-two-three-one. And again, we can criticise the defence all we like. I, I, the midfield double pivot is fine. That was Suchek and Rice. Obviously, it depends if Rice stays or not. Our kind of front four, we had Jared Bowen on the right, which I'm totally fine with. That's great. On the left, we had uh, Pablo Fornells, who is slow and is a classic number 10, but we were playing him on the left because Anderson has been awful. Up front, we had Mikel Antonio, which I'm fine with, although... I love Mikel Antonio. He's just not a very good footballer. Like, he's great. He runs. He's, he's genuinely a threat, but his first touch is is not that mm-hmm. great. So there's a lot of the time we'll go one-on-one and miss. Um, and then playing as our number 10 was Mark Noble. I love Mark Noble. I honestly, he's a brilliant human being and he's done so, so much for the club. He's not a number 10. And we were playing him in number 10 because we had this this kind of belief that he had to be on the pitch all the time. And the only place we could put Mark Noble on the pitch without him having to do a lot of defensive work or have to be really disciplined or have to not do much running was in the number 10 role. And it's just, I just look at it and I just think, wow, this is really bad. It's classic David Obviously Moyes. West Ham, yeah, West Ham sold Brady Diangana to West Brom, who would have changed our attack. I'm writing an article about this at the minute for World Football Index. And it's like Brady Diangana's fast skillful and plays on the left and we don't really have anyone who is fast skillful and plays on the left and we sold him to someone who's inevitably going to be kind of our rivals at the bottom of the table yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not too optimistic <laughs> yeah see for west ham i was like okay by november i could see Moyes being sacked just because such a bad start and then you get a new manager bounce and then you'll probably be all right but touching on the grady diangana don't pronounce that again yeah i don't know how much hamish you know about this but nothing at all <laughs> So this, you correct me if I'm wrong, Luke, but 
this player was he was on loan at West Brom last year, I believe. Yeah. Done really well and he was expected to come back to West Ham and then as you said like transform your attack maybe. But you've gone and sold him to West Brom because you needed money and now there's like basically West Ham hate the owners. So Karen, Karen Brady, David Gold, David Sullivan. It's quite funny. So within kind of the, the news breaking that Dean Garner was going to be sold, it, it was trend number two on Twitter behind PMQs. That was the only thing more tweeted about at that point. Yeah, people really hate the owners at West Ham. Really, really do hate the owners. And a, lo- a lot of the time, people don't really get it. People don't really get oh, it. People don't understand like the angst with them. And it's because when we left Upton Park, the, the promise was that they'd take us to the next level. And I, I was a season ticket holder. And I never believed that the next level meant kind of challenging for the Champions League or challenging for the Premier League, stuff like that. That's nonsense. No West Ham fan in their, of course, there might be people not in their right mind, but no West Ham fan in their right mind believed that we'd be competing for the Champions League. But the board promised, they said, we will be in Europe within five years. And since moving to the London Stadium, we've sacked a couple of managers and hired Moyes twice and really struggled to stay in the Premier League. And the promise was, we'll take you to the next level. And that's why we had to leave Upton Park. And I don't know if you've been to a game at the London Stadium. Um, I've been Upton Park a few times, but no, I haven't been to London Stadium. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it. It's, it's really bad. It's awful. And yeah, people were just people are just really devastated that like the owners have taken us away from a proper football stadium, taken us to an athletics track, and not really invested in the team. And it's just... The thing with West Ham is, I hope I've got this across throughout this kind of where my expectations lay. It's like West Ham fans don't expect us to win. And West Ham fans, even when we were in the championship in 2012, we sold out Upton Park. We were selling 35,000 seats to watch us play Bristol City in the championship. Like, that's not a problem. People don't mind being relegated. People don't mind West Ham being rubbish. But this notion of what West Ham was has kind of gone away quite significantly. And it's even silly stuff that like neutrals won't notice. So like if you look at our old badge, it had the castles on because that's what the stadium looked like. And I kind of get that they took the castles off. But they also put West Ham United London in like really small letters. And they were trying to get rid of the United bit as well. Um, so like now on Twitter, we're just West Ham. We're not West Ham United. And it's things like this that really annoy people because it's like we're not West Ham London. Like, not like a Pez Pro Evolution soccer team. Yeah. No, exactly. And it, it was just branding exercise. And one of the criticisms of, of the new stadium is like there's just lots of tourists. And again, that's not a criticism of people going abroad and watching football matches because it's something I'd like to do. But kind of when you make these big promises and so staggeringly un, like, under deliver, that's when you come into an issue. And it's like if you promised at work that you'd have a program finished and it'd be the best thing ever within two days and then you kind of sent them back a, a Word document saying sorry, I tried my best. Like, it wouldn't go down well, would it? So ultimately, they're just not very good at running a football club. Um, like they, managed, they they owned Birmingham City and they got them relegated. And they tried to get Birmingham City Council to build them a stadium. And yeah, it's quite frustrating, to be honest. And there's lots of rumours about kind of Red Bull West Ham. And again, that wouldn't be, that that would be kind of not great either for obvious reasons. But to be honest, it's it's moved so far away from what West Ham was that for lots of people it's like unrecognizable like i used to go with my dad and he won't go anymore like if i got us tickets he wouldn't go he just wouldn't go to the stadium because it's that bad like he hates it and this is someone who supported west ham like all his life when when it was like back in the day kind of yeah. thing. it's like wow so like this is how this is how far away it's moved if we go down i think we could be kind of a bolton situation really like, honestly yeah no i do worry because well we moved we moved into the stadium partly because we we're going to make all this extra money we're going to sponsor the stadium we're going to do all this the stadium we've been there what i think this is the fifth season we don't have a stadium sponsor we're still sponsored by kind of a betting company we lost our best player in dimitri Payet. we lost mm-hmm. mark arnautovic to china we didn't support kind of the best manager we had in kind of recent history in Slavon Bilic. And now we're not buying players because we can't afford them. So, and again, the big criticism of, of the owners as well is Eze just joined Crystal Palace from QPR for 20 million. He posted worse numbers in the championship than Dian Garner. wasn't kind of perceived as being as good as Dian Garner in the championship. And we sold Dian Garner for less to someone who we're going to be competing against. It's just kind of a real, it's a real shame what's happened because West Ham had the opportunity and I do genuinely believe that when we moved, we had the opportunity to be kind of like best of the rest. We could have been always in the conversation of being seventh or eighth or ninth. Yeah. And that would have been fine. I would have been perfectly happy with that. It's it's just not gone, <laughs> not gone to plan. 
So the Diangana situation, because we're from like a pretty much a town away from each other. So I've got like a lot of West Ham fans, grew up with a lot of West Ham fans. So my group chat, like most of my friends are West Ham fans and they were going off on, on all of this stuff. And I, I don't know too much about him because I was, I was a bit confused because I saw it, everyone complaining and everything. And I was like, surely what's all the fuss about if West Brom have bought him? Can't be that good, can he? Like surely when mm-hmm. top clubs, like the amount of fuss that's being kicked over this uh, player, or is it more just because you're selling him to West Brom arrival, like in your kind of position? Yeah. It's also the fact that we've not replaced him. Mm. So the idea is that we sell him and we might bring in the inner defender, but we don't really have anyone on the left who succeeded. Like Felipe Anderson's our club record signing. And I can't criticize kind of the owners for not spending money at times because they spent, I think, 36 million on Anderson in 2018. And he's just not done well. Spent 24 million on Pablo for now, and he's been all right, but he's not a left winger. And people are really excited about Diangana because this is a kid who'd like played for the academy since he was 12, had broken through at West Brom under someone who previously managed West Ham. And I don't know if you would have seen this, but lots of West Ham players have spoken out since he left. Yeah. So Mark Noble did a tweet saying that I think it was sad, angry and Jack disappointed. Jack Wilshere commented as well, didn't he? Yeah, Jack Wilshere said something about going to a club that respects him. There were a lot of players like across the team. Robert Snodgrass tweeted. And West Ham players don't normally speak like that. And I think, and again, I've spoken about Mark Noble kind of not being an attacking midfielder, which is definitely not. At the closing ceremony of Upton Park, and it still hurts to say that, there's quite a famous clip of him saying, this club ain't run like a circus anymore. I I quote him verbatim. And for him to then come back a couple of years later and then to criticise selling a player is is quite something because he's Mr. West Ham. He never criticises the club. He's always, I think you can tell with Noble that he doesn't necessarily agree with what's happened, but he's always just trying to keep us together. And I think this is the first time he's publicly kind of gone on the record as saying, yeah, this this not this isn't good enough. So yeah, when you have the players, and again, there was a there was an article on the website. So we played Ipswich and we beat them 4-1. Um, and after the game, they spoke to Sebastian Haller, who wasn't good last year. And um, they spoke to Haller and basically they were talking about how Dean Garner had given them a number of, of assists in that game. And he said, Yeah, I'm really looking forward to playing with him. It's gonna be so great to have this relationship, all this kind of stuff. I'm so looking forward to him giving me more assists. And then two weeks later, we sell him. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but there's there's issues at play, I would say. Yeah. Well, he's he's one of the players I've got down as a as a player to watch for this season. Also in there, I've... Uh, you said it as well. Easy? Was it easy? Easy? Easy. 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 I've also got Alan. I think um, maybe not a lot of people might know, know about him because he's played abroad. But I think he'll be someone who I think will be really good for Everton. And any any players you think in particular people should watch out for? Oh, so my my rogue one was Diangana. I wasn't expecting to go into a rant. <laughs> so he, he's 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 one to watch. And um, Calvin Phillips. Oh, Calvin Phillips. Yeah, he'll either be really good or just quite uninspiring. And people go, "Well, yeah, he did it in the championship. He's not that good anyway." I'm genuinely excited to watch Thiago Silva because he's not the kind of player that normally comes to the Premier League. Like he's a huge name, and normally it's the other way. Like big names don't come to the Premier League, they come to the Premier League and then leave once they're a big name. Another kind of one I would say that I've just thought about as well is Phil Foden, because if he plays, he's, people talk about Phil Foden in glowing terms, but he's not really played, like he's played 76 times for City. That's a lot, that's more than I thought. Yeah, but a lot of them are off the yeah. bench, so it's not like he has that many minutes, and of course he made his England debut kind of last week. So yeah, I think he's he could be quite interesting. Yeah. What about any shouts for Hamish as well, like Player of the Year or Golden Boot? Dude, I don't know enough players. I, I'm trying to research at the same time you guys are speaking, <laughs> and I was thinking about questions to ask, but I'm like so dumbfounded by the things that are happening because I'm like five years out. Dude. The um the Player of the Year. If we're going by my predictions for the league table, I think KDB's the obvious shout. If I think City's going to win, I think Bernardo Silva as well. I really rate him. I think he could step up massively, especially with David Silva gone. Depend, I don't know if Pep's going to make Phil Foden that guy or maybe move Bernardo Silva into that position. And then my heart is telling me this is this is Paul Pogba's time, whether that will happen or not. <laughs> I don't know. And Golden Boot, Man City, I think, I don't know, they spread the goals out quite a lot. Pep's rotation. Aguero's going to get goals no matter what, but May United, I think it's quite similar. Martial, Rashford, Greenwood, they'll all share the goals. Bruno as well. So I think I'd probably go with the Timo Werner or a Bamiyang. Timo Werner will be interesting to see if he's like a, a Shevchenko or a, a Diego Costa. So um, Golden Boot, I went Timo Werner. But again, that could either 
be the obvious pick or the worst pick in the world, depending on how he kind of settles in. Player of the year, I didn't really know. I went to Bruyne because he's kind of my favourite player in the league, and I think he's probably the best player in the league. I think yeah, I'd, I'd say so. He's just yeah. so good to watch, and even when Man City aren't good, people rave about De Bruyne. So he's all he's whatever happens, he's, he's definitely going to be one of the contenders. And again, like he came back from a really serious injury, didn't yeah. he? The season before last, he didn't really play that much. I think he played probably ten times. And last year he kind of didn't miss a step, did he? So yeah, I, I think he's he's such a such a good player. Maybe, maybe something you can touch more on Hamish Fantasy Premier League. I don't know, Luke, if you play it. I do. I'm kind of in a in a rebuild phase, but yeah. Okay, cool. Any any like fantasy Premier League tips or players that you've chosen maybe that people should have a look at? There's lots of quite good value defenders. So Saliba at Arsenal if he plays, I think he's only Yeah, he's pretty cheap. He's four point five million. Ben Johnson at West Ham, although he had a shocker yesterday last week in a friendly, is four million. He'll probably play for West Ham if you're just looking for someone cheap on the bench. Is he a starter right back? He should do. It looks like it will, if not, it will be Fredericks and he's quite cheap as well. But I, I personally, I hope it's Ben Johnson, <laughs> if I'm being honest. The other cheap um, alternative to Johnson in defence would be Nathan Ferguson, who joined uh, Crystal Palace from West Brom this summer. Um, Raw did an interview with him, which is actually quite interesting. Oh, really? Well, yeah, yeah, no, that, that because there was a lot of speculation at the time that he was going to leave. And I asked him about it and kind of being a student newspaper or public uh, or station, we don't really get much interaction, but there was like, he had loads of West Brom fans getting really angry. It was quite funny. Has anyone gone for like, you know, Van Dyke or anything like that? So what I do in defense is I, I have all of them as cheap as possible. So all the ones I've named are really cheap. And then I just have Trent. Yeah, I've got Trent as well. I think Trent's a must have. The only issue with Trent is everyone has Trent. Yeah. So part of me wants to have Robertson to have the differential. Yeah. I'm very competitive, so I, I, I really like winning. Um, so I, I take I take FPL quite seriously. Um, but yeah, I think Trent's like the obvious pick. And again, like in goal, I normally just have a cheap goalkeeper, like 4.5 million, and then the other one will never yeah, play. Same. So I just pick like a 4 million one. And then yeah, as, as you say, I just like... In my team, it's going to change around because they're not kind of starting the season with games. But like my expensive players, I've got De Bruyne, Salah, Werner, and Aguero, plus Alexander-Arnold. So like... I tend to get some like really good players and the rest kind of mix them around. I think an interesting one, um, if he plays, is Kelechi Ignacio at Leicester because he's only 6 million hmm. and Jamie Vardy is 35 or something yeah, crazy. Yeah, he's aging. And Le- Leicester are in Europe as well. So if Vardy plays in Europe... Okay, yeah, good point. ...could be interesting. But yeah, that obviously depends on who plays. But yeah, I, I think there's there's lots of really interesting players. I think like Casilla who's at Leeds United, is very cheap on fantasy footballs. So, um, it's like 4.5. McCarthy's 4.5 as well. But yes, fantasy Premier League is always something that I start off doing and then forget after like the third or fourth week. But I want to keep, keep playing this year. We'll have to give you our code. So we started a third wheel league, people listening as well. And we have decided to give the winner of the league, we'll buy them a football shirt of their choice. They have to also follow the third wheel on Instagram, so... Um, make sure you <laughs> leave yeah, that. It could be for like next season, I guess. The shirt, no point buying a kit from this season. But yeah, we'll leave the code like in the description. But I guess by the time this episode comes out, you'll be one game week behind. <laughs> so we'll post about it on social media beforehand anyway. If you want to join, yeah, I think that covers. I don't know if there's anything else you want to touch on, like the Premier League side of things. There is the Coventry Stadium plan, which I know you wanted to touch on. Yeah, briefly. So basically, Coventry City and the University of Warwick, probably a month ago now, announced that they had kind of entered into an agreement partnership that would see the football club build a stadium on land currently owned by the university. Coventry will be entirely responsible for the cost and building of the stadium. Um, And the only thing that has to do with the university is it's on the universities, and this is a quote, agricultural field area which where is this where is it yeah okay so from conversations i've had with various people kind of involved across football in the region is so you um you know where the new sports center is yeah so my understanding is it's basically going to be behind that but kind of so you know where uh, the varsity pub is on the corner which is very specific for people who didn't go to Warwick. Yeah. <laughs> um but there's a road there and it's basically going to kind of my understanding is it's going to be there which is interesting. But it's all very tight-lipped because the university won't really say what's going on. They won't say where it's going to actually be built specifically. And it's kind of against the backdrop of what's going on with the Rico. So Coventry don't play at the Rico Arena anymore because they had a massive argument dispute with Wasps 
So now they play in Birmingham. So it's all, it's all very complex. Um, I was just interested interested to see kind of your thoughts on it because as kind of ex Warwick students, would you have liked that? Because there's a lot of talk on campus. I would have liked it. I think that's pretty exciting to have a you know a championship like a football team of any level play like close to like where you're staying or studying. I, I think I would have like even been tempted to like get a season ticket or something if it was happening around that time. Oh, so for me personally, I'd be like, I don't think I'd want that because yeah. So obviously, I grew up in and around Wembley, so I'm used to the football havoc, and especially when Spurs had to use a temporary stadium here, it was a nightmare. Yeah, and when I went to Warwick, for me, that was like open space that I'd never seen. I was like, you know what? I like this open, green, fresh air. You don't get that in London, right? So like, I was like, whilst I'm here, I'm going to enjoy this. Yeah. So if they're taking away more like open space and stuff, they're just making it more like, which is not obviously obviously there's good reasoning behind it. It's just like. From my point of view, I'm like, I wouldn't want to go to a place that's football busy as well. Like, I like being, you know, isolated and cut off from a lot of the world in Warwick, in that Warwick bubble. Whereas mm-hmm. if the footballers or whatever are coming there, there's going to be fans, it's going to probably come onto campus. And yeah, I don't know, like, there's like anything around a football stadium. If you haven't lived around one or like lived around like a super busy one, in my case, <laughs> Wembley Stadium, it is is not nice. It's manic, like. There's obviously good things like all the local businesses benefit as well, but generally, like it does, it does like it. I think it does more damage to an area, like whether it's traffic or damage to property, like all the fights that happen as a result. I don't think it's necessarily beneficial, and especially like students. I feel like in a purely student area, because Warwick is just basically a student area, right? I'm like, will it fully fit in? Like, obviously, the football fans will benefit that are there, but does it benefit like everyone else that that may enjoy like that peaceful bubble that Warwick is? in my that's in my head so obviously i can understand people will be like oh that's amazing for them i think do warwick get to use a stadium like warwick sports team so they're not said that it's very very early um and kind of looking at the statement it basically says kind of a partnership coventry will be responsible for building and owning so they'll pay for the stadium but it's quite difficult isn't it because one of warwick's kind of unique selling points as you say is the fact it's in the middle of a field and they have a lot of, like, a lot of the students are from London. A lot of the students like the fact that it's kind of a little bit de- mm. detached. At the same time, that's also a reason why people moan. They're like, oh, it's in the middle of nowhere. The Wi-Fi is rubbish. Um, so it kind of goes both ways. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's, it's tricky. I think the university would have to get something else out of it. Because if it's just money, people will turn around and just go, well, Stuart Crofts bought another car or kind of whatever it might be, or the accusation. So I hope the university kind of does something mm. extra with it as well. And kind of another story that came out as well at Warwick is they're using the accommodation to host athletes for the 2021 yeah. Commonwealth yeah, Games on campus. And we sent them a freedom of information request, which they basically just swatted away and wouldn't tell us anything. Um, mm. But yeah, it obviously kind of with the financial strain of kind of pandemic and like the lack of international students coming back onto campus they need to find ways of making money i guess and of course money kind of makes the world go round and that's going to be the thing it just depends kind of how detached from campus it is because if you have and i mean you've you've obviously been there on open days like campus is manic on an open day and yeah, that's true. like ten thousand people and they're, they're talking about building a twenty thousand seat stadium on the edge of campus somewhere in an undisclosed location um so yeah it it depends on like the transport links how people get there because if they if it's like very detached from campus if like because they're talking about building like a coventry version of the dlr if that happens and they just like drop the fans straight at the stadium nobody can really complain but obviously if if it affects people getting to lectures and everything then it's like yeah and you have to remember the parking restrictions will get worse and parking around warwick is already a hassle for those of you who drive so if this happens yeah like living in an area that is basically purely locked off on event days you can't park practically anywhere people are just you know renting out their driveways so here if at warwick that happens it's gonna be more of an issue because people can't park in canley and so on so and because the students can't park on campus there's this massive like unless they've changed in the last few years which i don't think they have yeah it's just gonna be a massive havoc. i don't think sometimes the implications of a football stadium or like any like massive like you know event venue nearby is understood by a lot of people especially at the scale and then obviously my one's the extreme case because it's like ninety thousand seats but i don't know personally like i just i wouldn't want to live anywhere near that again one thing as well i didn't like about Warwick was just the amount of like building going on it just yeah it was horrible so in one point i'm kind of like okay another thing that's being built on campus it's more like construction area it's just 
doesn't look good visually. So I'm like, but having said that, I'm also not studying there at the moment, so I don't really matter. It doesn't matter that much <laughs> in terms of what it looks like. But also, probably most of our listeners know this about already because I've said it about a million times. But once I, when I graduated from Warwick, I went to San Francisco to work, and I, I went for a year, and I went to go see an MLS game, and LA Galaxy with Zlatan Ibrahimovic was coming over to play the San Jose, San Jose Earthquakes, and. That game was actually held at Stanford University. So I, I like traveled to Stanford University and then they had like a, I need to, I need to check what the capacity was, but they, they had a stadium on campus because like university football, American football there, it's like every university has like a massive stadium. And I just thought it was like really cool, like going to the university and these university students having like a stadium on campus where these like footballers would come to play like say Coventry in FA Cup get like Man United or Man City and they come over to like Warwick Campus I think that would be like pretty pretty sick there, also one more thing to add on is when you even have to do your normal necessary shopping on event days it's literally manic or well, everything that you do normally is massively impacted by event days so I don't know I know I'm, I guess I'm saying this in a negative light but like I mean like I know it's obviously all good that they're getting a football player and there's gonna be like revenue in local area etc more people there but that may not necessarily work out for the but especially students, because that's just solely a student area. I can't, me personally, I'm like, I liked Warwick for what it was when I was there. I can't imagine it with any more buildings or any more, like, I guess, you know, a stadium of all things. It is tricky. The, the only thing I would say, it depends what the university gets out of it, and it depends where the stadium is. Because if it's far enough, far away enough from campus, like central campus, that kind of people don't go through campus that much, it would be fine. If, like you have if they're saying like tired hill or something then go ahead fair like no one really cares <laughs> yeah but like much. if if you have like hundreds of commentary fans getting off the 12x on a wednesday to watch <laughs> yeah. to watch stoke at home it's it's, it's not going to end too well is it? it it's really interesting it's quite quite interesting i i, I will emphasize as well i don't know this no one said this to me in the yeah. very tight lipped but could you imagine if they could use it to play varsity that would be <laughs> that'd be pretty crazy that'd be okay i think yeah yeah, pe- people have said stuff like that to me, and I was like, "Yeah, I don't know." But um, wouldn't the venue cost them too much for like what they get out of it? Yeah, it would depend on what kind of partnership they have, because yeah, it's it's all very com- because obviously they've got the um, Jaguar Land Rover building, which the university uses. Yeah, I think it, it works really interesting going forwards because they need to like respond to how the world is changing, and remains to be seen. But yeah, no, it's just interesting to hear your thoughts on that because. I think we've got both sides of it as well because there will be lots of people who hate this idea and we published an article for the board that basically was by someone who clearly wasn't much of a football fan saying well it's going to attract kind of brash loud football fans and it's like well yeah okay and then you'll have people who will love it because they like football so like there's two yeah. sides to every coin isn't there? i don't know it's... how the uh coventry ultras are as a fan base like if it was like millwall or something i'd be a bit like mm, maybe not but uh yeah i don't know i don't know how uh rowdy the coventry lot are not too bad, I'd say. Not too bad. Um, that that leads on nicely to a preview of our next episode. Uh, our next episode is actually like a more of a, a back to school kind of Warwick, like our experiences at Warwick University with like the new new term about to start. But yeah, awesome. So our structure of the show, we have like our main content, and then we end it with some final questions, a call out, and a shout out. So final questions, we'll start off. First one for you is. So we know we didn't touch on it too much, but you've got a few podcasts yourself. So first question is, who would be your dream podcast guest? Um, so I, I do sport and politics. So my dream sport podcast, I'm, I know I'm cheating the system here, having to, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> dream sport podcast guest would be Slavan Bilic, because he is kind of the greatest human to ever live. <laughs> politics would be Barack Obama, because I feel like that would just be, oh, that's a really obvious answer. But no, I think they're the two. No, for me. no go for it. So yeah, and the second question is, what's on your bucket list? Um, the twenty twenty six World Cup because it's going to be split across uh Canada, Mexico, and the US, which is just insane. And it's got like host cities as varied as like Vancouver to Guadalajara. That's going to be amazing. As as I said, like I, I'm really into like North American soccer. Interviewed a couple of players who play in the Canadian Premier League. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'd I'd love to be at a game in Toronto. Toronto is like one of my favorite cities. Um, so yeah, that that's something I'm really looking forward to potentially because that's. And again, it's going to be like one of the expanded tournaments as well. It's going to, I think it's going to have 46 wow, okay. teams or something like that. 
so it's going up a level as well. So you're going to have really random countries, not random countries, but like lower quality kind of in terms of football countries at the tournament. And you play the tournament on Football Manager and there's like really bizarre matchups. Like that. I, I did a, a game where I, I was Canada and I was in a group with Japan and New Zealand, but there, there were like proper random countries like taking part. And it's going to be so good because it's going to bring so many people together. And like you look at it and it's like US, Mexico, Canada. It's like literally a whole continent so the football should be really good because there'll be so many more teams qualifying like jamaica will probably qualify and they'll have like leon bailey playing and canada being the host they'll have alfonso davies yeah i was gonna ask too did you know about alfonso davies before he became who he is now so i watched him play left wing in mls and people always talked about him as being good um people didn't really expect him to to be Mm -hmm. that good he's a huge success story. The player I'd watch as well, kind of from a US Canada perspective going forwards, um, Weston McKinney. He's currently he was at, at Schalke. Uh, Schal- yeah, he's going to go to Juventus. He's such a good player. He's a bit like Declan Rice, but slightly quicker. So yeah, I think he's going to really burst onto the scene. But there's like, there's loads of really good players in North America who who will come over and break through. So yeah, I know it's quite it's it's growing yeah. really quickly, really quickly. Third question. This is a question we ask every guest we have on. And that is what has been your most memorable third wheeling experience. So that's like if if you third wheeled someone or someone's third wheeled you. I don't really have any to be honest. I just I don't know. I listened I listened to last week's uh, two weeks ago podcast, and again you gave that answer and you, you seem pretty disappointed. <laughs> um, what I would say is I went I went to oh, what was it? It was a Saracen match with um, my best friend and his girlfriend. I was just sat there and <laughs> I ended up basically being the bar service. <laughs> So no, that's, that's more than enough. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, something like that. No, that's a good sign if, if it's a struggle to come up with a story. That's good. Yeah, the next section is a call out where you can nominate um, a bunch of people if you'd like to hopefully come on the third wheel in the future. So yeah, go ahead and call anyone out. Uh, sure. So I'm going to call out um, my friend who I do the pre-match pint with, Callum Ison. He's like a social media guy at ITV. Went there straight out of six form. He's He's a great person to talk to because he's like into like. Lots Wait, of is this the guy with uh, views on Twitter that you don't agree with? Is this thing? Okay. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put him on the <laughs> podcast. I don't want to say his views. But I get Callum, Callum is very brand friendly, although he has to because he works for um, a major TV company. He has to have the whole views. Not the okay, yeah, thing. Yeah. I mean, he, t- he tweets about politics quite often, and the amount of kind of like hardcore kind of Brexiteer people in <laughs> bias going like metropolitan liberal elite media kind of hate the people it's quite funny so no he's great to talk to you because like he's he's kind of works on the youtube side of it so again like his interesting perspective is like into football into kind of politics and music and that kind of stuff so yeah he's the person i'd call out yeah awesome and last bit shout out so we can all just like shout out anything we want really luke anything i'm gonna shout out the best food in coventry taste vietnam is quite frankly the best the best food in in the city and, and of course the city of culture uh, next yeah. year I, i'll mm. give it a, a brief profile it's it city look, of culture. yeah next year so it's the 2021 city of culture um Mad. which again interesting <laughs> and th- th- this restaurant is like the highest rated thing on TripAdvisor in coventry and it's literally got like three seats and a really dodgy like table it's mainly a takeaway but it's really good food um so yeah that's that's my shout out that that leads me, Aaron. Yeah, yeah. You know why he's gonna have to shout out now, like four episodes in a row, probably. Um, so I'm gonna shout out my trip advisor. Then I do have a, a bunch of lem Indian and fish and chip places shouted out on this, so y- you should be good to go. And in another episode, I do discuss which other places on campus that you should probably go to. So I don't know. I probably coming out t- a few weeks after this, so stay tuned. I guess you know, follow Third Wheel on all socials, etc. But yeah, my my trip advisor will be in the description. I've been trying to get through more London places slowly but surely <laughs> now. So yeah. Go ahead on over that way. Cool, awesome. I'm I'm gonna shout out um just our fantasy Premier League. We will be like one game week already in, but if you want to join it, join it. As we said earlier, that we'd uh winner of the league after the end of the season will get a we'll buy you guys a shirt of your choice. You can have like a name and number on the back. Um the code we'll pick keep put a link in the description where the code is IXX9I7. If you wanna join. Yeah, yeah, give us a follow on like all the social medias as well. But yeah, I'll give that a shout out and also shout out just to uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and the boys for the new season. Uh, <laughs> just, yeah, hopefully it all goes well. And nice meeting you, Luke, by the way. It's been a really good episode. 
really informative to someone like me who doesn't follow, follow football that much or sport. No, thank you. It's been really good. To come yeah, up. and it goes without saying as well, like, go check out like the Ball Sport podcast, um, the Ball Sport as well, and your two other podcasts. I've got here Midfield Politics and Pre-Match Pint podcast. So links to all yeah. that will be in the description as well. So yeah, as Hamish said, thanks again. Yeah, I think it's been really great. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. And I guess we'll just speak to you next week. Wait, have a good day, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. I remember.